Some of you will have seen this before, this little flyer on, it's called the meltdown of Catholicism. And there's a beautiful picture of the Vatican melting. Um, or well, St. Peter's in Rome melting. And it's an overview of the book by Michael Davis, The Second Vatican Council of Religious Liberty. It's a very good book. Um, Michael Davis is the, now I think, the chairman of Univoci. He's got quite a high position. He's a very good writer, very good brain, and um, very scholarly, very thorough in what he writes, especially his books. But he has one drawback, and that is that he wants to make, he wants to sell conservatism to traditionalists, and then he wants to sell tradition to conservatives. In other words, he wants to stop, as he sees it, stop traditionalists going too far away from the church. That's how he sees it. But at the same time, stop the conservatives from getting too liberal. So he is sort of dancing across that side of the church from one, from one part to the other. So he's a little disturbing in some of the things he says, and you can't, you can't completely rely upon him. On the other hand, there's some things which are absolutely excellent. Um, and this book is excellent. So, um, it's an overview of the book. Um, when we were looking at Leo XIII, we did not see, well, we did see the principle of religious liberty, uh, the false liberty, the liberty of conscience, the liberty of worship. So we did see what he said about it, about these false liberties. But he obviously never imagined that, the, that it would get into the church. But religious liberty is, is one of those principles, like ecumenism, which really means the meltdown of Catholicism. I mean, the Catholic Church just can't stand this kind of principle. It's like a seller of ice who somebody would persuade that he ought to, you know, market his product out in the middle of a sunlit field. I mean, if you sell ice in the middle of brilliant sunshine, you're not going to have much left to sell after a couple of hours. Uh, so, if you try to apply within the Catholic Church the principle of religious liberty that men have the right to, um, that the state must allow equal rights to all religions, you're in dead trouble. Let's have a look. So look at the center panel on the back or, or the front. Why meltdown? You've got a center panel there. Why meltdown on the other side? The principle of religious liberty means briefly that the state must allow equal rights to all religions. You saw that in Leo the Thirteenth, namely that you know that that the state, um, while the individual may submit to the Catholicism, the state has no right to submit to one religion. The state must stay open to all religions. That's the principle of religious liberty. That's the First Amendment. In appearance, such a principle is favourable to religion in general and to all religions in particular. In appearance. And in appearance, the United States is friendly to religion. But in reality, it is most harmful to religion, especially to the Catholic religion. Because if you give liberty to all religions, what are you saying? They're all the same. They're all truth. They're all equally true. Now, if they contradict one another and they're all equally true, then they are also all equally false. If they're all equally true and equally false, then what do truth and falsehood matter? At any rate, in the domain of religion, nothing. Truth and falsehood may still apply in the domain of engineering, but in the domain of religion, truth and falsehood is just nothing. Therefore, since I want my children to learn truth in schools, what will I, what's the logical consequence in the schools? Throw out religion. Get religion out of the schools. Therefore, the First Amendment leads logically to getting religion out of the schools. See, the poor liberals, they say, no, the, the, the decent liberals say, no, 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 the first, first Amendment means that we should have religion in the schools, liberty for all religions in the schools. But liberty for all religions means that no one religion is completely true, that it doesn't, the truth and, and falsehood in any of these religions doesn't matter, in which case, what can any of it matter? It's a waste of time. Get rid of it. And that's logical. 
In reality, the principle of religion that is, is most harmful to religion, especially to the Catholic religion. That is why cunning enemies of the Catholic Church love and promote religious liberty, whereas the popes always used to condemn it. The reason is because man is created by God for God. So there you can see whoever wrote this flyer is after the same point, namely that man has an end outside himself and that end, <coughs> end is God. And God, the end outside of man, is the measure of man. Man is created by God for God to go to God by the one religion which God instituted and which he sealed with his precious blood for that purpose. God matters, the true religion matters, the truth matters. Whereas religious liberty says truth doesn't matter. It doesn't say it openly, but it, it doesn't say it explicitly, but it says it implicitly. Actions speak louder than words. And by the action of insisting upon tolerating all religions, you, by that action you say that truth or false at any of these religions doesn't matter. You don't say it in words. In words you say, oh no, I, I, maybe any of these is true. I'm not saying that they're not true. I'm just saying they must all have equal rights. Hey, if you say they must all have equal rights, then what you're saying is that whether one of them is true or false doesn't matter. One of them could be completely false, but you on your principle would still defend it. Therefore, truth and falsehood don't matter for you on your principle of religious liberty. Again, religious liberty means that man is an end in himself and that he must choose what religion he likes. He is the measure of what religion he is to choose and practice. He's an end in himself. Whereas if God is the end of man, and especially if God has revealed one religion, then man must obey that religion, and there can be no right of religious liberty for any other religion. It's, it's clear. So the true religion matters, and truth matters on the Catholic understanding. We Catholics know that. But now comes any state with religious liberty, saying, in actions that speak louder than words, that all religions, whether they're man-made or God-made, are acceptable. But all religions contradict one another, from which it follows that if all religions are acceptable and all religions are contradictory, then contradictions are acceptable. If contradiction is acceptable, then truth in religion doesn't matter, and if truth in religion doesn't matter, then no truth matters. Truth in engineering is a small thing. No, no truth in anything human matters. This profound discrediting of truth means the discrediting of the human mind which is made for truth. If, if the truth is valueless, what value is my mind? Therefore, what do you observe the youngsters doing with their minds? They blast them to pieces. Boom, 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 boom. Because the mind is useless. What, what point is there in cultivating the mind? What point is there in education? We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. Teachers leave us kids alone. Anyone know that? Uh, it's logical. Pink Floyd is logical, completely logical. This profound discrediting of the human mind of all its ideas, all its ideas, let alone the idea of God, leaves, since the mind is discredited, then sentiment and feeling become king. You've decapitated the mind, so all that's left is the heart. And that's why we've got the slush-mush society because the mind has been completely discredited. Hence, religious liberty may defuse religious divisions amongst men. You may stop by persuading the Catholics of religious liberty and persuading the Protestants of religious liberty. You may stop the Catholics and Protestants fighting one another, which is exactly what Pope John Paul II is all the time trying to do. Let's have peace amongst men by nobody taking any of their religion really seriously, not even us Catholics. We're prepared to trash our Catholicism just so long as we all get together and are happy together. Religious liberty may defuse religious divisions amongst men, but it can only unite men in a sentimental humanitarian mush which is neither manly nor godly. That's where modern man comes from, and that's why we've got today's triumph of trash. We've got the, the trash society. Because man is just slush and mush, because the reason is decapitated, because truth is of, complete, is of no importance. So all that matters is slush and mush, and enjoy yourself with all the slush-mush pleasures that you can lay hands on as fast as you can.
It's logical. How and why religious liberty always used to be condemned by the Catholic Church and how with Vatican II religious liberty at last conquered many churchmen is the dramatic story told in Michael Davis's book and summarized within. So here's his book uh, in 25 chapters and seven appendices. Michael Davis is always quite fond of appendices. He thinks of enough, something else so he sticks another appendix on. And <laughs> An introduction, two chapters. Then he presents the truth, like Pope Leo XIII, he gives us the truth firstly, because this is such a confusing and difficult question. Then he presents the error, 9 to 12. Then he presents the clash between the truth and error at Vatican II, the four sessions, 62, 63, 64, 65. Then he presents the fruits of the clash, which are, or were, the Declaration on Religious Liberty, which is the terrible document the terrible final document of the Council, promulgated in 1965. And then we've got the aftermath. Very interesting, the aftermath, Father Murray died in 1967, uh, and it, uh, Michael Davis tells us he was, he was promoting artificial means of birth control. He was defending, in 1967, he was defending uh, contraception. And that tells us what kind of a man he was, you know, he was just a man out of sync with Catholic truth. So, let's go to the introduction. The introduction, Michael Davis is handling difficult ideas, so he, <coughs> he puts it into concrete people, and there are, there are, there's one particular clash that embodies the, this clash of ideas, and that's the clash. November 11, 1963, at a doctrinal meeting in Rome, an American Monsignor and an American Jesuit clashed. The American Monsignor was Monsignor Fenton, and Monsignor Fenton was an American who vigorously defended the true doctrine, the true Catholic doctrine. And Michael Davis's book is dedicated to Monsignor Fenton. He's dead now, but it's dedicated to the memory of Monsignor Joseph Clifford Fenton, editor of the American Ecclesiastical Review, 1944 to 1963, whose clear, consistent, and courageous defense of papal teaching on church and state must once again be vindicated as the authentic Catholic position. So that's the dedication of the book. On the other side was the liberal Jesuit, Father Courtney Murray, who became a folk hero because he defended religious liberty. Interestingly enough, <coughs> Father Courtney Murray taught at, at Fordham University in New York. And I think it's Dr. Mara who told me that when, when Father Murray came back from the council, he expected to be treated like a hero because he had done so much dirty work for the liberals at the council. So the liberals ought to have made a hero of him. Do you know what the liberals did? He was already out of date. He had done that dirty work, but they were already on the next stage. So he was, he was old hat. He wasn't a hero. Wanted to be, but he wasn't. At least at Fordham, Fordham University, he wasn't such a hero. But for the liberal, many liberals, he was a hero, but not in his own university because they'd, they'd moved on. And, you know, he was... The revolution eats its own children. As they say, you know, vroom, vroom, vroom. You, you don't come down and then lay out and everybody admires you and loves you. No, if you pull the thing down, it will be pulled down underneath you and you'll be left high and dry. That's what happened to, uh, to Father Courtney Murray at any rate at Fordham University. The, the Catholic doctrine on religious liberty. Now, remember, the religious liberty is the doctrine that, you've got that on the back there, the state must allow equal rights to all religions. And remember that Leo XIII said that that's nonsense, that's absurd. Okay. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You've got true and false liberty. You've then got the state, the nature of the state, the, the state's duty to Christ, the state's duty as to heresy. Papal quotes backing that up, the Catholic doctrine of the common good, which allows... Uh, which does allow toleration. For the sake of the common good, the Catholic Church has a right to tolerate error. But the Catholic Church never, never, never has the right to approve of error. It may tolerate it in order to achieve a greater good, but it may absolutely not approve of error. So, the Church teaches that one, true liberty is to obey God's law. That's moral liberty, obviously. To do as one likes, in other words, I have a right to do anything that my free will wishes to do is false liberty. True liberty is moral liberty to go to the end, to fly across the Atlantic, 
natural liberty is a false liberty of man being an end in himself. Right? Natural liberty, substituting for moral liberty is a false liberty. Natural liberty, the basis of moral liberty, is not false, it's absolutely necessary. But natural liberty is substituting for false moral, uh, for moral liberty. In other words, moral liberty and license being wiped out because you wipe out the difference between good and evil, that's completely false. Okay, so. Two, the state is a creature of God because God created all the little individuals with their little blue streak and therefore God created any society, any human society that comes into existence is also a creature of God. It's a creature composed of the sociality fitted together of all the individuals making up that society, however big or small it is. <coughs> therefore the state must worship God and the state must do what it can to bring men to God because the state is a creature that owes its adoration to God and service to God. Three, every state must submit to Jesus Christ the King because the one true God took flesh as Jesus Christ and took flesh as King. Jesus Christ was King. Are you King, says Pilate? You have said it, says our Lord. Yes, I am. And therefore the state should favor and protect Catholicism because it is the one true religion. If Catholicism wasn't the one true religion, there'd be no need to protect it. But if it is, then it must be protected by the state. For any Catholic state, any Catholic state has the right to repress heresy in public, but it may tolerate heresy as a lesser evil than repressing it. If a Catholic state, by repressing heresy, was to drive everybody up in arms, to make, make the, the, the newspapers and everybody go crazy, then the wisest thing is to back off, because you're not going to convert souls by that. But nevertheless, the, a Catholic state has the right to suppress heresy. It has the right to abstain from suppressing it, but it also has the right to suppress it. It does not have the right to approve of heresy. And it does not have the right to give any rights to heresy. It can give toleration to heresy, but it may not give any rights to heresy. Heresy has no rights. It may have toleration, but it cannot have any rights. F finally, the measure of whether a Catholic state should repress heresy or tolerate it in public is the common good. Meaning, uh, what is the general, what will do the most good for the most people in this state? If suppression of heresy will do the most good, then the Catholic state will go ahead and do that. But if toleration of heresy will do more good to most people, because otherwise they'll all be up in arms and hating the Catholic Church, then toleration is the best in, in the circumstances. It's an imperfect best. It's a second best, but it may still be the best in the circumstances. So that's the Catholic doctrine. The liberal doctrine, he's got uh, in, six doc in six propositions, uh, Michael Davis lays out in six propositions of which a summary like this can only give a very, very brief idea. The liberals teach that human reason is the highest authority. Michael Davis is obviously quoting Leo XIII, Libertas. And therefore, church and state must be separated. Human reason is the highest authority. Therefore, the church has no right to be brought into the state as an authority above the state. And if the church claims that kind of authority, then the church and the state must be separated because human reason rules. It's reason that rules and not the Catholic Church. Therefore, reason will rule the state, men will rule the state, and the Catholic Church can do what it likes. But the Catholic Church will have nothing to do with the state. Therefore, reason rules and church and state must be separated. That's, that's liberal doctrine. Very briefly, I could, well, we, we may come back to that. Uh, in, and laid out a little more. The champion of that doctrine was this Father John Courtney Murray, an American Jesuit then who died in 1967. He must have been born around the turn of the century. He was a liberal Catholic, he was a lover of the world, and he was an Americanist. Ten. Father, thus, Father Murray taught that all men have a natural right to practice in public their own religion. That's what Father Murray was teaching before the council, and that's what he persuaded the council to adopt as doctrine. It's completely false. Men do not have a natural right to practice false religions in public. 
Every man has a natural right to practice the one true religion in public. But no man has any right to practice a false religion in public. He may be tolerated by the state, but he has no right to be tolerated. All he has is the right of the state to abstain from persecuting him if it will be for the common good. But heresy has no rights. In this, Father Murray was wanting to conform Catholic doctrine to the outlook of contemporary man. Michael Davis has a lot of quotes about, undoubtedly, I can't remember the chapter, but it's a number of quotes proving that this is modern man's attitude. So Michael Davis, uh, Father Murray, was once again wanting to fit the church to the world instead of wanting to fit the world to the church. Jesus said, going teach all nations, not go and adapt to all nations. Go teach all nations what I have commanded you, and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and behold, I am with you until the end of the world. But he said, teach all nations. He did not say, adapt to all nations. Father Murray was wanting to conform Catholic doctrine to the outlook of contemporary man, or to the outlook of the USA Constitution. Friend and foe alike, both Father Murray's enemies and his friends considered that he was an Americanist, namely, somebody who wanted the American doctrine of religious liberty to be transferred into the Catholic Church, to be adopted by the Catholic Church. And that's exactly what Vatican II did. <clears throat> and that's why Father Murray is called an Americanist. He was an American by nationality, and he wanted the Church to take over the idea of the great idea of the liberal American Constitution. The clash. So there we've got the truth, which is the old-fashioned Catholic doctrine, and now we've got the error, which is represented in modern times by John Courtney Murray, and Father John Courtney Murray in particular. Now we come to the clash, which was when the error and the truth met head on. And there were four stages. The Second Vatican Council was where the error and the truth clashed. And f the Second Vatican Council had four sessions. 1962, 1963, 64, 65. It was autumn of each year. Autumn 62, autumn 63, autumn 64, autumn 65. They would begin in sort of September, October, and they would run right through to November or December. So it began with 1962. In 1962, you get firstly tradition rejected, so the ground is cleared of the truth for the junk to come in. Secondly, the Americans move in because there were a lot of American bishops who were convinced that the best thing that the church could do was to adopt American liberal doctrine. In other words, a lot of the American Catholic bishops were not really Catholic, unfortunately. 64, there was a bitter fight. Archbishop Lefebvre and some other old-fashioned bishops took a stand in favor of the old-fashioned truth, but in 90, by 1965, it was the liberals who triumphed. That was that terrible council. Thirteen. At Vatican II, firstly, the traditional schema on religious toleration was thrown out. There was a schema drawn up prior to the council under Cardinal Ottaviani, and Archbishop Lefebvre took, took part in it, as I think he, as the, he said. And the Archbishop says that that schema was completely orthodox and cla classical. And notice, it didn't talk about religious liberty, it talked about religious toleration, which is quite a different thing. But Bayer, Cardinal Bayer, also had a schema on religious liberty. So, the first of the traditional schema on religious toleration was thrown out, and together with a lot of other traditional schemas or pre prepared documents. They were all just tossed out. They took two, or th two years to prepare, and the Archbishop says they were very well done. They were a real adaptation of the truth without changing the truth to modern times. But the Council Fathers weren't content with that. The Council Fathers were liberals. They didn't want a Catholic adaptation. They wanted a liberal adaptation. So, after the, the schema was thrown out, the Secretariat for Christian Unity took over. After the Archbishop, Archbishop Lefebvre always used to say that that's a very sinister organization, the Secretariat for Christianity. It was a means of getting around the classical Roman congregations. The Curia, the Roman Curia, 
had a it was built like a series of roadblocks in the way of error in the way of error one congregation the congregation of the doctrine of the faith one one congregation or another would block error so to get round all of those the pope built a new organization called the Secretariat for Christian Unity, which, which would be the promoter of getting all the Christians together, which would be the re end run around Catholic doctrine in order to get Catholics agreeing with all everybody else and everybody else agreeing with the Catholics. So the Secretariat for Christian Unity was an organization created by the liberals with the approval of the Pope in order to do an end run around the orthodox classical roadblock Roman Curia, which the Lib... Is that John XXIII or... Uh, uh, yes, I think the, uh, the Secretary was created under John the Twenty-Third. yes, I think so. Next, a year later, the Americans move in because the American bishops had a crusading sense of converting the Catholic Church to religious liberty. The, the American bishops really thought that the church needed to get with it. We American Catholics, we know how. And the, all of the bishops in the rest of the world need to learn from us how you get in sync with the modern world. And so next, within the secretariat and on the council floor, the American bishops backed Father Murray's alternate liberal text, because once the traditional text had been thrown out, Father Courtney Murray came forward with a, with a liberal text. And the American bishops backed it because the American bishops religiously believe the American bishops have a Sunday morning Catholicism, unfortunately. And their real religion in many of the American Catholic bishops was liberty, it was American liberty. The, and they would say, thanks to wonderful American liberty, we Catholics are able to practice our Catholicism in the United States. <coughs> Thanks to wonderful American liberty, on Sunday morning we can be Catholics. That's not a good deal. It's not thanks to American liberty that we have the right to be Catholics. It's thanks to God that we have the right to be Catholics. And to give credit to a liberal state for being liberal enough to allow the truth is to put the truth on the wrong footing. It's to make the truth subordinate to liberty instead of liberty subordinate to truth. Our Lord didn't say that liberty will make truth. He said truth will make liberty. He said the truth will make you free. That's what our Lord said. In other words, liberty rests upon truth, not truth upon liberty. So, uh, another interesting point there, Father Murray was such a liberal when the council started that his superiors forbade him to go to the Second Vatican Council, and therefore he missed the session of 62. I think uh, Michael Davis points this out in the book. Do you know who got him permission to get to 63, to the second session of the Council? Spelman. Yep. Yep, Cardinal Spellman. Now, Cardinal Spellman passes for being a conservative. But we've got some of his wartime sermons and speeches in the library. He was a liberal. Cardinal Spellman was a liberal. And it's because he's a liberal that he promoted Murray and made sure that Murray attended the council. Did he use Murray as a uh, Paritus, may well be. And do you know who Cardinal Spellman always said was one of his friends? Franklin. Pius II. Uh, Pius the Twelfth, Pius the Twelfth. Spellman passed for being a friend of Pius the Twelfth. The whole church before Vatican II was worm-eaten in a certain way. I'm not saying Pius the Twelfth was worm-eaten, but if he really was friendly with the Cardinal Spellman, he didn't really know what he was doing. Because Cardinal Spellman, Cardinal Spellman was a strict conservative in outer things, but the inner doctrines He's a liberal, and he was because he was an Americanist. He was an Americanist. I can prove it from a book in the library, if any of you doubt it. So he was very strict in all oh, beautiful Beretta and beautiful Kappa Magna, cloak, all of the uh, trimmings and, f and, and frills and furbelows, but 
as for doctrine, he believed in America. Was he also the military or American? You know, I, I don't know. I, I, it seems like he was. Yes. He was the same time. I was stationed in Berlin from 61 to 63. Yes. 62 for Christmas. I'm almost positive he was there. Yes. The same ass. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He must have had that job for like 25 years. Because he was uh, even during, he had it during World War II and even during Vietnam. I know he was in Korea. Okay. Well, that and he was. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I met him. I shook his hand. Okay. Well, I'm afraid he was a liberal. But a lot of those liberals were strict on the outside and soft on the inside. And then when Vatican II came, the softness inside simply broke outside. And they all just threw away the berettas, threw away the vestments, threw away, and began dancing with everybody else. So, the American bishops backed Father Murray's alternate liberal text. 15, in 1964, a bitter fight took place. The Declaration on Religious Liberty became a separate schema and it was bitterly fought over in three drafts. The Religious Liberty had, there is a document that had more drafts. The, the final draft was the sixth draft. It had more drafts than any, any other document in the Council because I don't think any other document was quite as deadly. And finally, after the fight in 1964, three more drafts were fought over in 1965 but the sixth and final draft was approved by the council, on the council floor, it was approved by the Pope, and it was approved by Father Murray. So it went through. Now what is that, so that's the story of the clash. Now what is in the document? And this is what we've got, this is what Michael Davis looks at in chapters 17 to 23. The problem of the doctrine then the fact that the article number one in the doctrine, the doctrine, the, 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 the document is in 15 sections. And in the first section, when a lot of the church fathers still refused to sign the document, do you know what Paul VI did? He had a sentence put into the first paragraph saying, this document is not out of line with tradition. Nothing of the rest was changed. Do you think that you change what's in the document simply by saying, saying what's in the document without altering one letter of the contents of the document? Of course you don't. But by simply putting in, this document is in line with tradition, a lot of the resistance collapsed and the document finally was signed. So Article 1 is no solution. The 19, in fact, the document demotes Catholicism, it's a demotion of Catholicism, which is hardly mitigated by a little, few little breaks thrown in, and which is universally recognized as being out of whack with tradition. And the, the gist of it is that error from now on is given rights. And that's the error, and that's the mistake, that's the heresy. And dignity is misunderstood. Why, looking just at this little schema down here once more of man's moral liberty and man, man, man having an end outside himself and man having, being an end in himself, what are the, what are, can anybody tell me what are here the two versions of human dignity? How is here human dignity correctly understood and how is human dignity here falsely understood? Anybody care to explain? What's the dignity of the mind to attain the truth outside it? For a Catholic, what's the dignity of the mind for a liberal? Liberty. To think whatever it likes. What is the dignity of a man's life as far as a Catholic is concerned? Eternal salvation. Exactly. And what is the dignity of a man's life as far as a liberal is concerned? Happy. Happy. Uh, yes, what, that, that, that a man be himself, self-fulfillment. That, that a man be himself. On, um, on the liberal calculation, does Lenin have dignity? Vladimir Lenin. Yes. On a Catholic calculation, does Lenin have dignity? No. Not to speak of, no. No, because he's made a complete mess of his life 
because he's fought against God and therefore he's definitely not achieved what God gave him his life in order to achieve. He's roasting in the fires of hell, undoubtedly. Uh, so, the, see, again, the dignity depends upon whether the end is outside or the end is inside. If man is an end in himself, then he is dignified simply, simply by being a man. And any man is dignified as a man. Who does that remind you of? Any man is simply and purely dignified, simply and purely by being a man. JP2. JP two. Absolutely. That's the false idea of human dignity. What's the Catholic idea of human dignity? What's an example of a, of a, of a really dignified human being for Catholics? Any saint. Exactly. Any saint. Exactly right. Sanctity is real human dignity because that's a man being fulfilled with regard to God. The liberal is the man being fulfilled simply by puffing out his chest and thinking he's a hot shot. And maybe a few other people thinking he's a hot shot as well, regardless of God. See the two completely different ideas of dignity? And then the document starts out with, modern man ever more aware of his dignity. That's a banana skin right there. The document starts on the wrong foot. Modern man, ever more aware of his dignity, is requiring freedom and limits on government. <coughs> that's, that's pure American, right? I, that we, human dignity requires limits on government. That's pure American. So, um, let's have a look at the, the, uh, Michael, Michael Davis's eight-chapter presentation of the, this deadly document. 17. The final text of the Declaration, Dignitatis Humanae, or DH, must be compared with Catholic doctrine because the last-minute traditional addition to Article 1 left the untraditional parts of DH completely unchanged. How smart do you think those bishops were who switched their vote when the Pope simply threw into Article 1 a statement that none of this contradicts tradition? They weren't that smart, were they? That's just like, like the Bonini changing Article 7 of the introduction to the Mass while the rite itself can, remains completely unchanged. Correct? Poor people. They don't, people don't think. People, not even the Catholic bishops can think. Well, it's easy to say for you and me. I mean, if you and I had been Catholic bishops in that atmosphere, I'm sure that you and I would have gone along with it. I'm sure I would have. Jim? Is there any way that uh, tradition can be destroyed completely? No. Or, or changed to such a way that it's unrecognizable? Do you know what our Lord says in his passion? The, the, that's not he says that, that he said, but not at the moment of his passion. But when he was going into Jerusalem and all the children were rah 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 rah, the Messiah. We love David. We love David. We love Jesus. We love Jesus. All the children were bouncing up and down, and the the Pharisees were furious. The Pharisees, were, can't you shut up these brats? And what our Lord replied, do you remember? If these children were to be made to keep quiet, the very stones of the street would get up and salute tradition. And if the liberals succeeded in killing off every traditionalist and shutting down the Society of St. Pius X, the stones in the street would get up and speak tradition. So tradition stands by itself? Uh, it takes some support. I mean, somebody has to stand for it. <laughs> well, I mean, they can't destroy it. No, they can't destroy it. They, it's going to be there. But it, it, American bishops must have thought, in as much as you just gave a lip service in Article 1, that sooner or later, tradition would overwhelm what they, what, what they didn't like about this thing. If they really had some questions about it. Yes. I wonder if they even thought. They, they didn't think. They had this warm feeling about liberty, and a warm feeling about the church, about Catholicism, so they, if you get the two together, we'll have a double warm feeling. And double warm feelings are really very nice. So let's have a double warm feeling and let's mush together the church and, and liberty. We'll have the best of both worlds then. Well, originally they rejected it, right? 
And then some that persuaded them to change their role. Yes. Originally, not the, the, it's not the American bishops that were rejected. I think it was a bunch of Spanish bishops, especially, that were standing out. And the Pope won them over. It wasn't the American bishops. No, the American bishops were all for the document. No problem. It was the old, some old-fashioned bishops who were still insisting. And so the Pope simply threw in an extra statement that it's a perfectly traditional document without changing anything else in the document. And the resistance largely collapsed. That was the prestige of the Pope. If the Pope said it, then that's it. If the Pope says that black is white, then black is white. That's wrong. It's maybe so strong even today. It's very strong even today. That's exactly right. You know, I must tell you this. After the Civil War, I asked many people, and Franco was at the height, if the Pope would command you anything, or Franco, whom would you obey? And to a man, everybody told me to obey the Pope. Yes. It's so strong. This yes, was. that's right. And it's lingering on until today. Absolutely. It's exagger exaggerated veneration of the Pope. They assume that the Pope is infallible in everything he says and does, and that's just not true. He's infallible only under certain strict conditions. All right, let's move on. So the, the last minute traditional addition to Article 1, here it is, I'll give it to you. This demand for freedom regards first to the free exercise of religion in society. Vatican II declares that this demand is in accordance with truth and, truth and justice and in accordance with church tradition. That's what they threw in. It's completely false. Completely <coughs> false. So, Dignitatis Humanae 19, in effect, reduces Catholicism from being the one true religion to being merely one religion amongst many. And that's logical. If you say that the state must tolerate all religions equally, must treat all religions equally. You're saying that all religions, you know, that Catholicism is just one amongst many other religions. In actions which speak louder than words, you're saying that Catholicism is just one amongst many other religions. It's true that Dignitatis Humanae does allow the state to help religion by the state's protecting public order in a broad sense. So, there are a few little titbits to tradition, a few little cap taken off here and there to tradition in the document, but mostly <coughs> it's just brand new doctrine. It's, it, it's, it's liberalism. So it's liberalism with a sprinkling of tradition on top, just to dis deceive people and make them think that it's still Catholic doctrine. But Catholics 21, from far left to far right, have all recognized, and that's interesting, not only the liberals, not only the conservatives attack the doctrine, the conservatives attack the document for being irreconcilable with the tradition, the liberals admit that the document is irreconcilable with the tradition. It's not only the conservatives that attack the document. They were like recognized, there's a problem in reconciling dignitatis with humanity with tradition. And the, the key point, 22 in heavy letters, is that the document affirms and tradition denies that propagators of error in public have a right to be tolerated by the state. That's the exact point of difference. Now, you may say that's not a big deal. But in the, if you spell out the logic, it is a big deal. Because the logic is this. The logic ends up in one case, man is an end in himself and his dignity requires that he be entitled to what he likes. And the other is that man is not an end in himself and that man, the state must operate on the principle of helping a man to achieve that end which is outside him. So the difference, the difference as you have it there, propagators of error in public have a right to be tolerated by the state. It doesn't look like a big deal. But the difference is as big as man is God or God is God. That's what it comes down to, logically. So it, it looks like a little, it's like a raindrop falling somewhere in, on the continental divide of the United States. If it falls two yards to the left, it's gonna fit, the raindrop will finish up in the Pacific. If it falls two yards further to the right, it'll finish up in the Mexican Gulf, go down the Mississippi and finish up in the Mexican Gulf. Just a tiny little difference in the beginning and logically it ends up completely different. So, if you think that the propagators of error in public have a right to be tolerated by the state, in ultimately you think that man is God. Whereas if you think the propagators of error do not have in public a right to be tolerated by the state, then you're admitting that God is God. It's a huge difference over what looks like just a tiny 
disagreement. But think about it, think about it, and read the book. Nor, 23, can such a right be based on the human person's dignity because error takes away a man's dignity. That, of course, is a Catholic or a liberal proposition to say that error takes away a man's dignity. Catholic. It's a Catholic proposition, exactly. For the liberals, error doesn't take away a man's dignity. I think that two and two is five. Oh, master, you are thinking, you are great, you are a man. I think that two and two is four. Oh, master, you are great, you are a man. You are thinking, regardless of the content. The liberals don't care about content, which is why words have lost their meaning, which is why uh, books have lost their meaning, which is why they can't think, why they don't think. It's all just man, 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 and feeling good about yourself. I think the liberals do care about content. And when someone speaks the truth... Oh, well, to that extent. That. That's interesting. Yes, of course, that, that is an inconsistency in liberals. <laughs> True. The liberals can tolerate any error, but they can't tolerate the truth. I just said, I had a dumb liberal over here saying, two and two is four, oh yes, master. But of course, two and two is five, yes, master. Two and two is fifty, yes, master. Two and two is four, what's that? Uh-huh, two and two is four, you can't say that, because if you say that, all of the rest of us will be put out of business. Therefore, you've got to be put out of business. If you say the truth, you've got to be put out of business, because the truth discredits all the liberal errors. And that's an, a continual inconsistency in liberals. The sweet liberals will tolerate the truth, but the real liberals will not tolerate the truth. And that's why they smash Catholic tradition. They don't mind anybody else talking nonsense, but anybody talking truth reigns on their parade. And therefore, anybody talking truth has got to be put out of business. Error takes away a man's dignity. That's the proper understanding of dignity. But Father Courtney Murray had the completely liberal understanding of dignity. Namely, simply by the fact of my thinking, I have dignity regardless of what I think. Finally, 2425, Father Murray died in 1967, leaving to the church a legacy of liberalizing and Americanizing ideas. But Fenton was also American, remember. And Fenton was a true blue Catholic. So not all American Catholics are Americanists. For instance, in 1969, all prayers irreconcilable with D.H. were removed from the Universal Church's liturgy. That was the new missile. The appendices are a little interesting. None of Vatican II's teaching had extraordinary infallibility, and only what was traditional had ordinary infallibility, and therefore nobody is bound to admit the nonsense in uh, the, doctrine, the document on religious liberty. It doesn't come under either extraordinary or ordinary infallibility. Next, between Pius IX's authoritative teaching in Quanta Curans, the syllabus, and, and dig, on the one side, and Dignitatis Humanae on the other side, there is, if not direct contradiction, at least irreconcilability. So the, the document is going against the... And you've got on the wing of the, the Vatican II tradition on the other side, you've got four examples of the clash between what the previous popes teach and what Dignitatis Humanae teaches. Three, in many formerly Catholic countries, Dignitatis Humanae opened the way to a grave undermining of Catholic faith and morals, and a notable example was Spain. Because the Vatican kept telling Spain, you must take away the special status of the Catholic faith. You must stop forbidding Protestants in public. And any state like Colombia or the valley in the canton of the valley in Switzerland or Spain, any state which still wanted to give, any Catholic state which still wanted to give any privilege to the Catholic religion was damned by Vatican II. And under pressure, Franco undid the state privilege of Catholicism in Spain. And the result is that, that Spain today is a mess. Oh, it's dead. Father Anglis, who's a Spaniard, tells you Spain is dead. Rick, Rick Rady's uh, daughter-in-law said that uh, all over Spain, they're very strong for Clinton because somebody has yeah. convinced the Spaniards that uh, Clinton is uh, 
doing everything he can to stand by the horse. A deliberate yeah. falsification. The, the, the Spaniards have gone crazy. It's incredible. Yes. Yes, it is. That's correct. In a very short time, it's mind-boggling. It's tragic. Dear Spain, great Spain, Catholic Spain, the creator of the Spanish Catholic Empire in the New World. God! The devil is taking his revenge on poor Spain. So, fourthly, the official spokesman of Dignitatis Humanae at the Council was a Belgian, and he tries to show that the new doctrine is just a development of tradition, but, but he, again, it, it was a real weasel speech. It's well done, it's cleverly done, but it's, it's a false as a $3 bill. The traditional doctrine on a state's tolerating public heresy is laid out in the preparatory schema which was rejected by Vatican II. We saw that in, in number 13. The, the traditional schema on religious toleration. Was that Belgian? Was that Belgian? Was that uh, De Smet is right, yes. De Smet is right. Sixthly, Pope Pius XII went into this question in a speech called Shirieshi. And he's, he taught that states may today have to forego exercising their right to repress heresy. In other words, he's, he's saying that in today's circumstances, said Pope Pius XII, who was Catholic, in today's circumstances, the state may not be able to repress heresy, and it may have to back off repressing heresy, but it still has a right to repress heresy. It may be obliged by the facts to back off, but it still has the right. It doesn't lose the right to repress heresy. And it's a completely different thing from the liberals who say that the state has no right to repress heresy. And finally, he gave, Michael Davis gives a chronological list from 1960 to 1965 of the events by which uh, Dignita di Samane emerged at Vatican II. It, the book is well worth reading. It's, quite, it's, it's not too easy in parts, but with that schema uh, and with that uh, introduction, you ought to be able to get hold of it, and it's well worth it. It's well worth it because you, you, you grasp what the, uh, you know, what the whole problem is about. Tonight, uh, bring any questions you have. Um, I haven't got another, I haven't got Unabomber 2 to bring, so uh, I will think in case I have something to bring, in case you haven't got enough questions, but otherwise it's a free-for-all. So line up your questions and bring a stake uh, I mean an S-T-A-K-E with matches to light under it if you want to burn me. <laughs> <laughs>